HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Powder donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Now, I'm sure you all know by now that Audible.com is a leading provider of audiobooks, but you may not know about all of the other content they have. It's pretty extensive. So we are offering you a free trial. You can go to audibletrial.com slash business growth, sign up for the trial, and check it out for yourself. I think you're going to love it like I do. The Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast continues to gain recognition as a great resource for small business owners, sales professionals, business leaders of all kinds, and that is because of the guests. These are folks who have expertise in particular areas of business, and they join me for an engaging conversation so they can share that expertise with all of you. Today is no different. My guest today is Sarah Weiss. Sarah is the CEO of award-winning market research firm, Bixa, and the best-selling author of Instabrain, The New Rules for Marketing to Generation Z. For 15 years, Sarah has been a guide to hundreds of leading brands, including Google, IBM, Capital One, Mickey Moto, PBS, and the U.S. Army. She helps brands achieve a laser focus on their customers to scale their businesses. She also lectures at Georgetown University and speaks at conferences worldwide when there is not a pandemic. (laughs) Thanks for joining me today, Sarah. Thanks so much for having me, Dan. I am thrilled. And we are going to be talking today about marketing to Gen Z, uh, which is so critically important. 
Um, so I would really love to start with asking you to explain how Gen Z customers are different than uh, millennial customers. Well, first of all, the Gen Z, and not many people know this, but they're the largest living generation today. So over 51% of the world population is under 25 today. And it is a whole new world out there. They are changing the game for just about every industry out there. And I mean, who, if the stereotype is true, man, that's a lot of brunch. <laughs> But so they're different than millennials for a few key reasons. And basically it's for a few reasons about why they, different, different things that happened while they were growing up um, and the different environmental factors, different parenting styles, that kind of thing. So the first key reason why they're different, why they're not the same is that there was a huge shift in parenting styles. So we went from terms like helicopter parent and tiger parent to a new kind of parenting style with the under 25, under 26 crowd called tech parenting. And with, instead of doing things for their kids, parents were a little more hands-off. They were teaching their kids how to find things for themselves online using technology. And they basically have raised, as a result, they've raised a generation who's a little bit more independent than millennials. But also what they did almost inadvertently is that they scared the crap out of them about basically anything that could go wrong online. Um, everything from online predators to identity theft and everything in between. And so you've also got this generation who's more risk averse than millennials. <laughs> So in addition to that, they were raised, um, unlike millennials who were raised in a boom economy, this generation was raised in a time of war and recession. Um, they were born after, po these, these are post 9-11 babies. I mean, they were born at a very different time and they have seen parents um, lose jobs, take pay cuts, clip coupons, budget in a way that millennials never did while they were growing up. And so wow. they're actually far more fiscally conservative. Um, I will say, I, I say that term and people go, oh, so they're cheap. They're going to love coupons. That's not totally true. They actually just want more value for their money. And they're very concerned about the value for their money. They're not, uh, I wouldn't call them cheap like this as a whole, this generation, but I would say they're more concerned with, okay, what am I going to get for my money? Um, they're not... Mm -hmm as concerned with um, coupons and sales and promotions as past generations. Um, they actually are much more interested in social engagement than coupons or sales, which is the first generation to really be, to really take that on. They're hungry because they were raised in a recession because of all the being fiscally conservative, all of that, they are hungry for work. Um, they're not, you know, coming out of school and going, oh, I'm going to take off a year and go explore Europe or, well, nobody's doing that right now. But really, like for the past few years, this generation, as they're entering the workforce, they're just ready to get to work. They're hungry for work. They're side gig savvy. They have like multiple jobs. They probably, they're very entrepreneurial. In fact, 61% um, coming out of high school say that they don't want to work for somebody else. They want to start their own businesses. So it's a huge wow. um, shift in just a very, it's a much more entrepreneurial mindset. And they're not waiting until they get out of college either to start their businesses. They're just starting them in high school, in college. Like they're just doing it on the side because the technology is so readily available. The other big difference between um, millennials and Gen Z too is this, is a shrinking attention span. So What's happened is because this generation has been bombarded by screens since the time they were very young. I mean, they were literally were toddlers teething on their parents' phones. I mean, they're the first generation to really do that. <laughs> and because of like, they've been just been watching images flashing from their face since a very early age. And their brains have actually physically rewired to process more information 
faster. So on average, millennials could, could juggle about three screen, can juggle about three screens at a time. So they can be like playing a video game, reading a Reddit thread, and maybe texting a group of friends all at once and keep it all straight in their short-term memory. But Gen Z can do that with five screens at a time. So they could be playing a video game, reading a Reddit thread, texting one group of friends, having a separate conversation on a headset with another group of friends and watching a sports game all at the same time. And it's pretty incredible how quickly they can switch context between all of these things because there's no, there's not really a, a thing called multitasking. They say, oh yeah, Gen Z are good multitaskers. They're not really multitasking. What they're doing is they're flexing their attention. I call it multi-flexing more than multitasking. They're flexing their attention yeah. very quickly between one thing and, and the next. And so that's why if you've ever had a conversation with a teenager and you think they're not listening to you because their head's buried in their phone, they really are listening to you. They can just do both things and switch their attention very rapidly. But because they're switching their attention between- Wow, that's so many really good to know. Yeah, but because they're switching attention between so many different things, their attention span on any one yeah. thing has shrunk drastically. So we're, we went from, with millennials, who had a, a 12 second attention span and everyone said, oh wow, millennials don't have any attention span, only 12 second attention span. Well, it got even smaller. And with Gen Z, because they're juggling all these different things that they're paying attention to, they only have a seven to eight second attention span. So for marketers, this gets really interesting because you have to know exactly who you're targeting and hook them really fast if you're going to be marketing to this generation. And you should be because they make over half of the world's population. But, and really an, an incredible amount in buying power that's coming out of this generation. About $650 billion a year in buying power. I mean, it's just unbelievable when you calculate in- Easy. And they don't even have jobs yet. I mean, just wait until they get jobs. <laughs> but it's when you calculate <laughs> their direct spending power and then all the purchases they're influencing their parents to make too. So that's, that's where that number comes from. But it's, it's really incredible the, the influence that this generation is wielding over pretty much every, every industry out there. I, I can't even think of an industry. Yeah. Even... even you know, I was talking to a company last week who was a manufacturing company and they were talking about how they have a strategy for market to, marketing to Gen Z. And I was like, how a manufacturing company, you're B2B B2 mostly. How, you know, what's going on there? Tell me about that. And they were like, well, these Gen Z is going to be our, they're, they're entering the workforce. They're going to be our new buyers and our sellers and our partners. We need to know how to interact with them. Right. Sure. Right. Yeah, so, so actually, we, start, we are, actually okay. have been, and what's really interesting is that manufacturing company, they actually have, are setting up this campaign right now to target Gen Z, even though they're a B2B company, pretty much. They um, are setting up this campaign that um, taps into the trend that's going on. Um, ASMR. Have you heard of this trend? No. Um, so it stands for autonomous sensory meridian response. And it is a YouTube trend that's going on right now that is, that's actually been going on for a couple of years, but this trend is bigger on YouTube than like, if you look at the search history, than searches for candy, for chocolate, for Kylie Jenner, for all three combined. It is this massive trend that nobody's ever heard of if you're over 26. And this company, they're tapping into it. It is, it's basically, this trend is, it's basically listening to calming meditative sounds and images on YouTube videos. Really? So it's people like playing with beads or like, um, um, smoothing sand out with their hands or the, the dulcet tones of Bob Ross or, you know, some, something like that. It's really, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting if, if you go on YouTube and take a look at ASMR videos. Um, but this manufacturing company, uh, they thought they'd do something really clever to tap into Gen Z and they have an engineer named Ed 
and they're doing a series, a YouTube series called Go to Bed with Ed, where he reads technical manuals. <laughs> and it, but he's got this very like calming voice and he's just reading technical manuals because um, most of the ASMR videos are watched about 1030 at night um, across all time zones pretty much. Um, and the, pe this wow. under crowd are going to bed listening to these ASMR videos. That is crazy. Okay. Yeah. But, so what does a company really do? I mean, so I, I actually, it's a two part question. How does that company think that is helping them grow their business? It, you know, as a marketing ploy, whatever. And, and what do companies do then if this attention span is seven seconds? Yeah. What do they do? Well, let's talk about the seven second thing, because I think that's most important to the people who are listening to this. Um, I don't know if the ASMR yeah. YouTube thing is actually going to grow their business. I think it's more of a, a brand awareness within the generation, within that, you know, as uh. as the audience. But what let's definitely talk about the seven second attention span because we can't ignore that. And what that re really means to someone who's marketing to this generation today is that like your past, you have to really, really know your audience because in order to grab their attention in seven seconds, you have to know exactly what's going to, um, to speak to them what hook is going to work. And a lot of companies, they think, especially companies who use paid ads, they think that they can just trial and error it. They can use the ads that they, that have been working for millennials. They can apply them to a Gen Z audience. They can target Gen Zers and, and they'll just trial and error their way into, into more sales or more leads. And it just doesn't work. I mean, I've seen companies lose tens of thousands of dollars just trying to do the trial and error with this generation because they didn't do upfront research and really get to know their this new persona. Really? Okay. So I guess the, the next logical question is, um, how do they get to know these consumers? What research methods should they be using? Yeah, so what, So my company does a lot of research with Gen Z. I mean, we do a lot of research with a lot of personas, but within Gen Z over the past few years, we've really um, kind of whittled it down to a few key things, key research techniques that work over and over and over again. Um, mobile diary studies are super effective. Um, so instead of like, let's say you want to know, we were working with a major co coffee company and they wanted to know how does this generation make coffee at home? And so we had them with their phones because they all have their phones with them 24 seven. Um, and they're used to documenting their life. They're just very familiar with, with documenting everything. We had them take a video of themselves um, for four straight days, we said, every time you brew coffee, take a selfie video and show us about brew, about how you, how you make coffee. And it turned out mm. that in this gen, because we had those selfie videos, we found out a really interesting finding that within a, a specific audience segment, 10% of them brewed coffee from their bathrooms. And really? We and the company was like, I don't understand how we didn't know that before. Um, and they were like, we've done focus groups, we've done interviews, nobody's ever talked about brewing coffee in their bathrooms. But because we had them on video in their own environments doing it, we were kind of getting, ethno it's, it's kind of a, a virtual ethnography method where you're getting a peek into their, their own environments and what they're really doing. So this is so interesting for me because it speaks to something that um, that I believe is a barrier for uh, for a lot of companies in a lot of ways, which is they know what they know and they know it so well that they can't think outside of it. So the reason they didn't know is because they didn't even know to ask the question 
where do you brew coffee because you think it's the kitchen well and they we when they would do focus groups or interviews they'd say where do you brew coffee and people would say kitchen because legitimately they had another coffee maker in their kitchens they just have a second one in their bathrooms because they wanted their morning (laughs) fix while they were getting ready that's so interesting i love that that is such a great idea and we've done this are there other research methods yeah and we've done this mobile diary study it's worked for a lot of different types of companies we did it for google news when we wanted to see like how are people how are people checking news so instead of asking them to record selfie videos we asked them to record their screens and show us how they check news and we learned a lot about what apps they use uh what competitors were like google news is competing competitors, things like that, why they switched between different apps, when they switched between different apps, you know, which news apps did people, did news junkies peruse when they were just, you know, waiting for a couple minutes versus ready to deep dive into articles. They use different apps for different situations. So, okay. So I have a question for you. Wait, hang on a second. Cause I have a question for you about, um, doing this with these folks, it sounds to me like they're very open to that sort of sharing. Is that fair? If you're paying them, yes. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> so, I mean, all of these research studies, right? We pay people to, to take, to do the research studies. So if you tell them they're there and they'll negotiate with you, unlike millennials. I mean, I said, I said earlier that they're fiscally conservative and, and, oh, and they love making money, this generation. And one thing that's really interesting, even when we're recruiting participants for our studies, when we talk to millennials and we recruit millennials for our studies, we're like, oh, okay, you know, we're going to do an interview. You're going to get $60 for the hour or something like that. And they're like, great, thanks. When we talk to Gen Z, we say the same thing hey, you're going to get $60 for the hour. And they're like, hmm, what if I refer to friend? Would I get more? What, <laughs> if, what if we did an hour and a half? Like they're negotiating with us, even oh, just wow. for a basic research study. Um, so it's, it was, it's kind of interesting to see even in just scheduling the studies, the differences in payments, money, communications, um, the questions around how do I get paid are different. Because if you tell somebody, um, if you tell somebody you're going to give them a check, they're like, I don't know what to do with a check. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, we pay electronically <laughs> now. So we pay, you know, they get a, they'll get an email and they can redeem it either on a gift card or they can PayPal it to themselves um, or Venmo it to themselves. But it's just, it's, it's so interesting uh, even just with setting up interviews between the different generations. But I think that the bottom line is that like your past research doesn't apply. Like if you've invested research, uh, doing research with millennials, it, it no longer applies because today's, today's younger audience really is doing things differently. They've, they've just had access to technology for so much longer. They're, they're far more sophisticated. They're bouncing between apps at such speed and they're so good at researching and finding things online quickly. Another thing, another big yeah, difference okay. is that they're such visual searchers. <laughs> they're such visual learners and searchers, they don't read nearly as much. Like they won't read blog articles or something like that. Um, They rely for like how to type of tutorials and stuff like that. They rely solely on videos on YouTube. Um, It's such a difference, Hmm. such a difference. Um, And I think the, the key difference is that the question in their minds has fundamentally shifted between millennials and older, and then this gen, new generation, Gen Z. Um, the question used to be, what do I want to know? And you'd go to Google and you'd search it and you would, you know, go down a rabbit hole, reading articles and watching videos and whatnot. Um, but then you'd learn about it. With this generation, they're not asking, what do I want to know? They're asking, what should I want to know? And instead of creatively thinking about what inspires them, they're relying on the creators they follow, 
the influencers on these different social media apps, they're relying on their news feeds and their algorithms to really give them, show them something that might, might spark inspiration. And that's why you see teenagers scrolling, just bored scrolling for hours and hours at a time. They're just waiting for inspiration to strike. That feels sort of dangerous to me. Oh, it is for sure. It's if someone feeds them information that's right, that, that, that's just like not true. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's not so much that it's not true that scares me. What scares me is that they are so connected to the creators they follow and the influencers. And if an influencer says, wow, you should really check this topic out or this this thing out or this video out, they're going to do it because their influencer is telling them to do it. Huh. This is fascinating. I'm going to take a quick sponsor break and then I want to continue our conversation. Just amazed. Um, okay. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. And while Audible.com has thousands of audiobook titles that you can choose from, they have so much more. There's Audible Originals, Guided Meditations, Podcasts, News, just all sorts of content that you can listen to and you can listen to it across devices so if you listen start listening on one device you can pick right up where you left off on another one which i think is one of my favorite things about audible um and you know right now uh the guided meditations are pretty great i will say that i think the biggest benefit i find in audible is that I can access all those different kinds of information all in one place. So like I don't have to go to one place for audiobooks and another place for podcasts. I can pretty much get everything I need all in one place, which is a time saver. So uh, we would like to share that with you. And you can get a free trial of audible.com by going to audibletrial.com slash business growth. Once you sign up for it, do your own exploration. Check out what is there. See what you like. I think you'll see what I'm talking about where it, it's a time saver because it's one stop shopping, basically. You can get everything you need. Today, we're speaking with Sarah Weiss about marketing to Gen Z. And I am totally fascinated by this subject. I, I am learning so much about this generation, and I, I think my kids are in this generation. I thought they were, were millennials, but I think this is them. Um, so Sarah, I, I understand that you have a really good story about a girl and her hedgehog, and I would love it if you would share that with us. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so this there was this girl we were interviewing, she was about 13 years old in Florida, and she, um, was scrolling through Instagram one day and she came across a photo of a hedgehog and she immediately like snap judgment was like, I love hedgehogs. I love this photo. I want a pet hedgehog. So she goes to her mother and she says, Hey mom, can, um, can we get a pet hedgehog? And her mom says, absolutely not. First of all, they're wild animals. And secondly, aren't they spiky, pokey, like they're not going to be the cute, cuddly little thing you think they are. And thirdly, aren't they nocturnal? I don't think this kind of pet is going to fit your schedule. Like it's not going to make a good pet. No, we're not getting a pet hedgehog. But the girl, so she goes, she says, oh, okay. And, but she goes back to her room and she starts, she opens her phone again and she starts looking at all things related to hedgehog. In fact, she kind of deep dives into this world of pet hedgehogs and watches for a week straight in every moment of her free time, she only watches stuff about hedgehogs and she watches it on YouTube and, and TikTok and um, Instagram and everywhere else, even on Pinterest, she's, she's pinning um, photos of hedgehogs. I mean, really like collections of hedgehogs. And this, 
you know, this, the snap judgment quickly became an obsession. And so when she goes back to her mother a week later and says, Hey mom, can we get a hedgehog? And her mother has the same three reasons for saying no, she's got an argument to each one. And so her mother finally, you know, she wears her down enough that her mother finally says, okay, fine. How much does a pet hedgehog cost? And the girl says, well, it's about $500 with the hedgehog and the cage and the food and the stuff you need for the pet hedgehog, blah, blah, blah. So her mother says, great. If you can raise $500, you can buy yourself a pet hedgehog. Great. Thinking that this is never going to happen because this is a 13 year old without a job. And this is just going to be something that passes. And right. But it doesn't. I mean, this girl is dedicated. She is, she just perseveres. And she goes back to her phone and starts, went, goes to YouTube and, and types in like how to make money from home. And she starts looking into that and deep dives into that. And she figures out that she really likes making slime and she starts selling slime. <laughs> and she actually, her mother has these like essential oils around the house. So she's making not just slime, but luxury slime, like lavender eucalyptus <laughs> slime and orange spice slime and all these different sense of slime and she's selling it at her school and she um, takes it down. She packages it beautifully and takes it down to the convenience store that's across from the middle school, the local middle school. And she says, you know, will you stock my slime? And of course they say no, um, but she goes back. She's persistent. She goes back every day and she talks to the manager and asks him, will you stock my slime? And finally, this guy gets kind of wears him down too. And he says, fine, we will put your slime on the counter, but I'm telling you, if it doesn't sell, like we're done. And within a few weeks, this girl makes more than enough money. It works. And this girl makes more than enough money to oh. buy her pet hedgehog. And she realizes too, that she loves making money. And she, <laughs> she starts selling it on Instagram. Now she doesn't have a website. She's literally selling her her slime on Instagram and, but she's making money all throughout the, the middle school and, and the high school, even um, selling <laughs> this slime and, um, and delivering this, this slime to people. So anyway, she gets her pet hedgehog and she actually gets her pet hedgehog now paid and sponsored. So she's making money on the pet hedgehog too. <laughs> And so I think oh my I, God, love I, love story. Story. I love this story because it illustrates a lot of kind of key points about this generation, about what they're doing, how they process information, how they're finding things and searching for things and looking for things. Um, this generation makes uh, a snap judgments about things and then really deep dives. And so for companies, you know, if you can hook, you know, they need to know if you can hook a Gen Zer quickly and get them really into something, investigating something and doing that deep dive, they become like, uh, like mini stalkers on whatever that topic is <laughs> almost. I mean, it's just, wow. they're, the, they're shrinking attention spans and co this constant waterfall of content have made for decisive snap judgments, but then these interests quickly turn into obsessions and they just, they crave every little detail about everything. They create, crave the behind the scenes story. They want authentic and personal insights. They want stories. They want videos. They want every little piece of shred of information and video and visual thing they can find about whatever they're looking for. And they'll spend a week really hyper-focusing on this. And, and millennials just don't have this hyper-focus skill uh, as well as, you know, as much as Generation Z does. They hmm. really, as a whole, can't sit down and just focus on one thing for a day. If, if a Gen Zer is interested in, in something, they will do that. It's kind of a superpower they have. Um, and so that's crazy. What, what companies need to know is that they need to make what, what happens too, is that this, this younger generation, they're going from app to app, from social media platform to social media platform, looking for the same topic. So you need to have enough information hmm. on different platforms and different information, not just the same information on all the platforms, but different information on different platforms to kind of make the scavenger hunt real. 
Oh, I love that scavenger hunt. That's interesting. So you keep them engaged because it's not the same content. So yeah, they're checking like you out all slightly over. different. Yeah, they're also this generation is really clear on where to where to post content and where to look for content. Like for example, for Instagram is for random inspiration, kind of slice of life things, whereas Pinterest is for specific inspiration. So let's say they want to be inspired about hedgehogs or they want to be inspired about cake decorating like in a specific topic. Twitter is for like professional announcements and even sometimes news. And by professional announcements, I mean like a YouTuber is, is deciding to, to post something, <laughs> you know, something like that. Mm. Google is for homework and discrete facts. Like the quicker they can get in and out of Google, the better. Um, you know, if they can see something in an answer box, they really don't mm. read as much. If they see something in an answer box and it answers their question, great, they're out of there. Um, YouTube though is more for like DIY, learning videos, TikTok is for like, is, is for fun. And actually TikTok is interesting. And now it's Triller. They're all, people are, all the influencers are leaving TikTok and going to Triller right now because of all the controversy going on. Um, but TikTok's interesting because I think uh, this whole generation kind of got on TikTok kind of like how six or seven years ago, they were all getting on Snapchat. So that because their parents just yeah. didn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they're yeah. doing the same thing with TikTok. And now once their parents are on TikTok, they're like, oh, okay, fine. I'm done. I'm yep, over it. Gotta go. Also, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also with all this added controversy and privacy information, privacy stuff going on, um, a lot of the influencers have switched over to Triller. So people are following as well. That might. Oh, that that's might really be interesting. I had never even heard of Triller. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then uh, Snapchat's really more for, um, kind of sending funny videos to your friends. Um, it's also for behind the scenes looks at, uh, for brands or influencers to post videos, uh, little behind the scenes things. They, they want that kind of behind the scenes, mm. sneak peek kind of things they can't get anywhere else. And then whereas Snapchat's for kind of fun, random video, random things that they're sending to their friends, random messages. Text messaging is for things that are more urgent. So like, where, where are you? What's the answer to homework question number two? Where are we meeting? What time are we meeting? The, that kind of stuff. Oh. Um, so more urgent things are for text message and specifically iMessage. Oh, the blue bubble uh, versus the green bubble debate. 84% um, of Gen Zs have iPhones. If you have a green bubble, wow. if you have an Android, you are ostracized. It's like you are a social pariah. You are not included <laughs> in things. It is like this generation's version of Mean Girls. And then Facebook is oh sweet. Really, Facebook is for parents. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe older. Yeah. Yeah. So they have, they all have Facebook accounts so that they can communicate with their parents <laughs> or send videos. <laughs> oh my goodness. And so, you'll notice I didn't mention, I didn't mention LinkedIn and I want to point that yeah. out because we actually recently did a study on uh, Gen Z and LinkedIn and they about over half of Gen Z's have LinkedIn accounts, but it's so intimidating for them. They hate it. They don't go on it. It is not meeting their needs. Um, if they do go on it, they go on it just to look for jobs and get off. They don't look at the news feed. They don't, they don't interact in any way. It's not a social app for them. You know, I think part of the reason for that is that when they're in college, they have to set up a LinkedIn account and connect yeah. to 10 people. But no one really teaches them more than that, you know, like the value of it or how to engage with people. So... Yeah. And I mean, the study we just did showed that they felt so intimidated because they were on mm. there seeing all these thought leaders and people with big resumes. And then they added their resume and it was just, it was not even close, a close comparison. And, and it shouldn't be because they're young. <laughs> right. They, they right. felt like they felt intimidated by, you know, Hey, I've mm. got, a summer, a summer working as a camp counselor and, and maybe some, you know, working at the checkout at the GameStop or something. And that's the extent of my, my job <laughs> experience versus, versus, you know, somebody who has 20 years of experience. Right. 
<laughs> That's really interesting. Okay, so um, can you give us some examples of like some of your favorite campaigns that you think have done a good job speaking to Gen Z? Yes. Um, there is, there's a number of beauty campaigns that have come up in the past, um, I'd say the past few years that show kind of authentic beauty. I think authenticity is a really big deal with this generation. And it's just showing models and people in advertisements that are not so touched up. Um, you know, it's just, it's very, it, it's, it's a little bit different for this generation that they, that they can find something like that uh, and see, and see something That's like that. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, authenticity is big in all sorts of different videos. It's, it's big. Um, it, it's just, and, and it, it's boils down to, are these real people making real recommendations or are they paid? Hmm. Um, so it, it has a lot to do with the influencers too. And that's actually one of the reasons that many marketing companies, out, many marketing departments and companies out there right now are not using mega influencers nearly as much as they used to. They're actually relying on, they're using the budget to hire multiple micro influencers or even nano influencers. Um, so mega, so the difference there is that a micro influencer has about a hundred thousand followers or more. And a nano influencer may only have a couple thousand followers and normally they wouldn't mm. be considered an influencer except that their um, engagement rates are through the roof because they have real authentic followings who engage and connect with them. A lot of them, a lot of them are local influencers and it turns out that using your marketing budget, especially if you're a local company, a local small business, especially using your marketing budget to hire, you know, 10 nano influencers versus one micro influencer, it's going to get the word out a lot more and in a more authentic way. That is so interesting. I mean, it makes sense. I know with podcasting, it used to be how many um, downloads, you know, and how, how many listeners you had. And then it became really valuable to have a real niche audience and community that was loyal, that, you know, was always following you because then it cut through the noise. You know, if someone advertised on the, that podcast, they were really cutting through the noise and hitting directly their target. Yeah. Um, a couple other campaigns that I've loved this, actually the past couple of years, um, I've loved that TurboTax sponsored a hashtag um, on, on TikTok. And it was around Super Bowl of last year, but it really went wild. Um, you've probably heard the song, it's all people are tax people. All people yeah. are tax people. <laughs> and like, I can't, I can't hear the song without like seeing in my mind people like with hands on hips, shaking legs and then clapping. Um, and <laughs> it just, this went crazy on, it was like hashtag all people are tax people. And they put the, they sponsored a sound on TikTok. So all, so there were just millions of videos with the same song with people doing the same song and same dance, just in different settings. And it just went nuts with this generation, you know, wiggling their legs <laughs> and clapping their hands. It was just such a, it's such a, a wide scale. Um, and they did a really good job there. Um, I love campaigns that use user generated content. I mean, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of companies out there, especially companies that are small businesses or um, don't have a huge budget to create content themselves. They're using content created by their customers. Um, they're using photos of their customers with their products. Um, it's just, for example, Buffer uses um, the hashtag Buffer community uh, to showcase like photographs and personalities of just different users around the world. And the images aren't promotion promotional or even like remotely brand centric. And that's kind of what makes them so effective. And yeah, I mean, it's just, it's really, 
it's a good one. Um, yeah, that's that author. It, it's connective, right? Yeah, it, and people really resonate with furniture, it. The furniture store Wayfair does a good job with user generated content. Mm -hmm. they, they've got a hashtag Wayfair at home that lets customers kind of showcase the results of their online shopping. And especially when you're thinking about this generation who's now, you know, getting their first apartments and decorating and buying things online, um, people can post their home setups uh, with those with those type of products. Hmm. Um, there's a company Bloomscape that does the same thing with plants, and that that company's interesting because they're not cheap plants, um, but they 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 have positioned themselves as, as high quality plants that you don't have to that are like ready to use and you don't have to uh, really do anything like they're big plants. You don't have to, there's not a lot of care and feeding you have to do. They're easy to care for. They're already in a pot. You don't even have to buy a pot. They come shipped and ready and they um, <laughs> showcase a lot of user generated content around um, people with plant, you know, photos of, of their plants, people in the plants in their homes. Wow. Um, the, the mattress company Casper constantly comes out with great campaigns for Gen Z. Um, Gen Z really appreciates hacks, kind of brands that they find resourceful or clever. And that's why brands like Casper are kind of popular with this demographic that they're, um, they're a mattress company where they ship you match mattresses and they come really small and then they like, they get huge when you open them up. Um, but before Casper, the idea of getting a bed in the box in the mail was really unheard of, but they really had a deep understanding of, of their target audience and realized that the direct to consumer approach could be effective. And the business model is basically a hack and they leverage the idea of clever hacks on social media to, to build brand awareness. Like they really, they've got a bunch of hack related campaigns, like the staycation story hacks campaign. They've got unboxing videos, waffle crush Wednesdays. They do, they do a really good job. So those are, those are a few of the so, campaigns that I, that I've seen to answer your question that have worked really well. Yeah, no, thanks. I, I appreciate it. I, I get, once you say it, I get it, you know, and, I, and I've seen some of those. Um, so if a, if a company is thinking, okay, well, we really need to be marketing to this demographic because it, it's, you know, the largest, um, do you think that they need to have people that age in the company? or just people who understand that demographic? I think you can have people who just understand that demographic who un and who understand that it's much different than, than, previous dem than previous generations. But I think it's easier if you've got somebody that age that who's there and, and they're entering the workforce in droves right now. I mean, there's a lot of people on the job market right now who are coming out of college and yeah. looking for jobs. Yep, that is so true. Oh my gosh. Sarah, I so appreciate this information. I have learned so much. I feel like I understand these people so much better than, you know, it was fuzzy before. Um, so thank yeah, you actually, for that. And when you tell the listeners, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to um, yeah. give your listeners too a little uh, kind of freebie. If you go to bixaresearch.com slash free chapter, so B-I-X-A research.com slash free chapter, you get a free chapter of Instabrain. And also you'll get a list of the top research techniques to use uh, with Gen Z. We talked about one today, which was the mobile, mobile ethnography, uh, mobile, mobile diary studies, but there's a number of other um, good research techniques too that you can use with them and you get a, a PDF of that as well. Wow, that's really great. And is that then how they can get in touch with you if they want to? Yep, um, bixaresearch.com is my company, my company's website and they can certainly get in touch with me there or even schedule a consult if you're interested in research work for your company. That's terrific. I think that is uh, critically important, especially with this um, age group, this generation. So thank you. And listeners, thank you. The, you know, this was 
a very enlightening episode um, that I think will help all of us as we move our businesses forward. I'd also like to thank our sponsor. You can get a free trial of audible.com by going to audibletrial.com slash business growth. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, Powder Donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. At Acuity Insurance, we believe the things you do for your business every day are nothing short of heroic. And you deserve someone equally heroic to protect them. Like the breaking ground on new construction things. The every box and barcode matters things. And the driving the family business forward things. We put our all into covering your business so you can focus on the things you love most. That's the power of heart. Acuity Insurance. Wholeheartedly for you. Great careers are forged out of great relationships. Your success, whatever your field, relies and thrives on the support and insights of others. I'm Andy Lapata, an author and speaker on the power of professional relationships. In the Connected Leadership podcast, I have the privilege of interviewing people from around the world to understand the relationships that have made a difference on their journey and how their insights can help you. From Nobel Prize winners to Olympians, from NASA astronauts to peace campaigners, my guests have shared some captivating moments from their lives and careers. Combined with experts from leading universities, cutting-edge authors and giants of business, the Connected Leadership Podcast aims to inspire, educate and entertain. 